Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Newsweek, where we highlight some of the biggest stories that the news headlines spoke of in the last seven days. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. This week, it wasn't just another courtesy call when Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gwajabi Amila, reached out to President Muhammadu Buhari, bringing to his attention concerns about killer herdsmen in different parts of the country. While this was ongoing, popular Islamic cleric was negotiating with bandits in the Shinkafi forest of Zamfara State on the need to lay down their arms for amnesty. Also, the Inspector General of Police, Mohammed Adamu, gets a three-month extended stay in office beyond the statutory limit by President Mohammed Buhari. Could he end up with an appointment like the ex-service chiefs who have been nominated by the President as non-career ambassadors? We'll seek an answer to this and more later on on the program. Welcome to Newsweek. Stay with us. Let's begin in Oyo State, where Governor Shei Makinde led a delegation of top government functionaries to Ibarakwa and its environs, where he promised to do more to safeguard lives and property. He also pledged to bring succor to residents whose means of livelihood were affected by activities of suspected herdsmen in the area. The activities of headsmen over the years left sour taste in the mouth of residents who have had either their properties destroyed or a loved one killed. This visit by top government functionaries in Oyo State is coming at a time public confidence and trust in the security system is at a low ebb. The state government met with traditional leaders across political and ethno-religious divides, all in a bid to douse the tension and put a stop to the wanton killings in the locality. When they see something, they have to say something. Uh, you know, so passing across uh, all of that and also uh, letting people know that uh, 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 I also, I feel their pain because uh, uh, Dr. Fatah Aburude, for instance, uh, I mean, I've had uh, uh, very uh, a close interaction uh, with him in the past, you know, so uh, I feel the pain as well. And uh, 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 I believe uh, uh, with everybody coming together, uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, tackle the problem. The governor and his entourage also visited victims of Earthman attack. He restated his commitment to finding a lasting solution with an assurance that government would provide adequate compensation for their losses. We have to, that was why we uh, asked for uh, the state police in the first instance. Uh, it's a constitutional issue and in the uh, absence of having state police, the states in the southwest came together and we formed Amatekun as a stopgap. So um, uh, we will keep uh, uh, problems don't go away uh, uh, completely. You know, you have to keep working at it. You have to keep uh, 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 pushing. The leadership of the Oyo State Legislature was not left out of the fray. Speaker of the House of Assembly promised to adopt legislative means in restoring lasting peace to Ibarakpa land. But I want to appeal to all of us that the issue of security is a collective effort, is a community effort, not just us relying on the security outfits, the security agencies, but for all of us to come together to report any case of insecurity or any suspicious movement of people or any information that could help the security agencies. Once that is reported to the appropriate agencies, I can guarantee you that we will have a safer environment to all live in. For us, we encourage our people not to um, give up, um, but to believe even more so in our security agencies, especially the police who are in charge of the internal security of this country 
and um, the Amatekun wheel. Operational vehicles were also donated to improve security within the area. The state government has promised to put its best foot forward in concerted efforts at restoring peace to an area pivotal for the constant supply of food across the country. Olutai of Moscow, TVC News, Ibarakpa. Yes, we're glad you could join us. It's Newsweek on TVC News. We will review the big stories of the week. And you just saw one of our first, uh, the governor of Oyo State, visiting Ibarakpa. First of all, let me welcome my guests. We have two studio guests today, our executive editor, Uzonna Onoye. You're welcome, Uzonna. Pleasure. Yes, we also have Onye Kachi Adekoya, a security consultant. Thank you for joining us on Newsweek. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. So I'll start with you, Uzonna. Um, Governor Shea Mackinday's visit to Ibarakba. Uh, let's, let's bring it home and make it a bit more personal. If you were an Ibarakba indigen or citizen, so to speak, how reassuring will that visit be for you? Government officials have always done one thing, rhetorics. They, when things get out of control, they begin to speak, sometimes um, being inconsistent with themselves. But a lot of people see less than they desire from people in government when things are developing. And that would have been the right time to act and not wait until situation runs out of control. So the people of Ibarapa will receive, certainly will receive whatever visit from anybody now with mixed feelings. They have pain in their hearts. They are, they are, you know, missing their loved ones that, you know, were caught in the crisis. They lost property and they live in uncertainty, so to say. And so people that are coming now who could have done what they should have done earlier would only serve as a reminder that um, the care is not really there. So that's what I think that all of this is. Mm. Onyekachi, Governor Shea Mackinley said something instructive there. He said it's a constitutional matter. And given the reaction of um, Southeast governors about a ban on you know, grazing in the bush and all of that, um, what, how would you assess the response of Southwest governors in the light of recent events in the um, of the Southwest, to be precise now, or your Anomo state? Yeah, um, I do want to agree with the governor that um, it is a bit of a constitutional issue, uh, but I think it's more a political issue than a constitutional issue because it is law for man, not man for law. Uh, where you have the political will, we should have been able at this time in our development as a country address this issue once and for all. Uh, I don't want us to limit the response to what's happening in the Southwest. Because all over this country, in the Northwest, in the Northeast, uh, people are having issues. The Northwest, for example, is almost the size of the UK. England is what landmass of about 130,000 square kilometers. The Northwest is almost 240,000, 220, 240,000 square kilometers in landmass. The UK is about the same size. And the UK has different tiers of policing. We all talk about the internal policing structure of the country. Um, sometime last week, the media was agog with how do you set an agenda for the service chiefs. And I kept saying to people who get to listen, we are just wasting our time. The, the problem is not the problem of the service chief. The problem is not the problem of who is our IGP today. Because Nigeria has constituted today, no matter who the IGP is, he's incapacitated by the details of his political office. The, the IGP is almost a politician. It's no longer when you become IGP in Nigeria, you shift from being a technocrat, you become a politician. So there's a lot of issues of politics, managing your manager, managing interests. The IGP's office is a market. Politicians are thronging the place. Emirs, Obas, people of influence. It's a market. So operationally, the DIG operation runs operations for the police. Okay, but then structural issues. So I, I don't want us to say what is the Southwest. Southwest governors are complaining. Southeast governors are complaining. South South governors are complaining. Interestingly, all the governors in the Northeast are singing the same song. 
the structure we have of security in Nigeria today has outlived its usefulness. We now have a more dynamic population. The situation with security is quite fluid. You know, we are dealing with uh, diverse issues. And the danger is, I mean, I don't want to overanalyze the issue. But let's look at the issues, maybe three-pronged. You have the issues of farmers' headers clashes. That's not a big problem. You have vigilantes associated to the farmers that carry out certain actions or revenge or repressive attacks against the headers and then creating more problem. You have militias attached to the headers or affiliated to the headers. They carry out their attacks, revenge attacks, repressive attacks, suppressive attacks, pursuing their own agenda. You then have organized armed criminal groups. Okay. We are so, dealing uh, uh, with... Granted, it is hydra-headed. Yes. It's as, quite hydra-headed. As you have analyzed. Yes. And then you say that it is more political rather than constitutional. Uh, absolutely. So um, how can Amoteko now, we saw them in that report, rise above the politics and actually execute the task that they've been, um, you know, conferred with at this moment to rein in on uh, marooding killer herdsmen in the bushes, in the forest of the southwest? Very good question. It's just like what you, what he said earlier on, that um, politicians, after they act, um, play bits of the gallery. The civilian JTF, for example, in the Nazis, they pay them 20,000 naira a month to lay down their lives to protect their fellow citizens. How much is a Moteco and a Moteco operative going to be getting? And you can verify that, that it's 20,000 naira oh, For a the month. JTF, yes, I operate. I mean, I'm always in the north. So these guys are in what? Peters to provide security. You give them, they are not even enough. Okay. Or your state is, for example, over 28,000 square kilometers of land mass. How many Amotec cooperatives do you have? Hmm. What is their obligation? All right, all right. Onyekachi, Onyekachi says it's, it's a, a bit of politics. But for you, Uzona, if we bring in the position of, uh, I think, the Taraba state governor now, who is saying that it has come push has come to shove right now, and then people need to carry arms. Is it um, politics <laughs> that is still playing out? <sighs> Allowing people to carry arms in a society that is broken, like Nigeria is, is putting it simply an invitation to the beginning of the end because we have a system where the level of distrust between, you know, among the people is deeper than you can ever imagine, where every move or every action or inaction is read in different, diverse ways. And then you license people. We, 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 the, the crisis America has with with the guns will be a child's play to what will happen if that is done here. But instead, but not recall. Instead, okay. instead, government should rise to the responsibility of protecting lives and property. That's what they sought to. That's what they sought to. And when those, I mean, when government fails, absolutely fails, because it refused to act, I use the word it refused because between headers and farmers, using that as, a, that as an example, did not start in Oyo State. Benue State was torn to shreds some months back, a few years ago. Benue State was a theater of clashes. Even, even beyond months ago, and that's where I want to remind you about something very important at this point. Remember in 2018, in Benue and in Taraba State, the... Um, um, brought about a legislation of anti-grazing, but then the federal government resisted that, prevailing on the state government not to implement the anti-grazing law. And recall what Oyekachi said just moments ago, that it's a political issue. So what choice would you leave state governments who say that it has come to the point where our people now have to carry arms it's... if legislations are resisted? Yeah, legislations are resisted because it's, it's just the messy game of politics that we, have, we find ourselves in. Why should I use my own business to rear cattle, to destroy your own business 
to farm. And because we have paid lip service to this issue, that's why I brought it in and then went to Benue State, where that cl those clashes were prominent some years ago. And when it kept, you know the funny thing? You said, you put it very mildly, that federal government resisted it. But they resisted it in a very shameful manner, where the Minister of Defense is singing a different song. The presidency has a different idea of where the militia come from. And who, the chief of army staff was saying a different thing entirely. Some said they were, export, they, they were imported from Libya. Some said that uh, cattle rearers have the right to protect their cattle and all of that. You see, it's confusing. And until the federal has control over the army and other uh, uh, security forces, leave the issue of the state governors being the, the chief executive or the chief security officer of the state, that is just on paper. In the real sense, all of them derive their power and their control and their command from one place, and that is at the federal government. Until the federal government decides to approach this issue squarely, we have gone beyond the era of saying that cattle rearing or you know, moving around freely is the culture. No, we have gone beyond that. The, the life has become more complicated, and so there has to be a clear, well-defined you know, approach to this. If you want to rear cattle, it is nice, it's important, it's agriculture, it's economy. But it has to be done in such a manner that it does not hurt the next person. Once we don't draw that line, I am not saying that farmers are innocent. He said, he brought in something that there are vigilante groups that are backing up the farmers. Yes, they could go and carry out some kind of oppression, cattle rustling and even, even a clean um, um, cattle rear as it is a possibility because the atmosphere exists in the first instance where lines are crossing indiscriminately. And until the federal government addresses that line crossing indiscriminately, we will continue to have these issues. Interesting point there. How realistic is open grazing or the nomadic culture of uh, cattle herders in today's modern world? Very critical question, not just for my guests today, but for those of you watching as well. You're on to Newsweek on TBC News. We'll take a break now and be back with more. Stay with us. We're glad to have you back. You're on to Newsweek on TBC News. President Mohamed Buhari has extended the tenure of the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, by three months. Mr. Adamu was due for retirement on the first of, his, of this month. But with this extension, he has more time to remain in charge of the police force. The announcement was made earlier in the week by the Minister of Police Affairs, Megari Dingyadi, at the Presidential Villa, Abuja. Mr. President has decided that the present IGP, Mohamed Adamu, will continue to serve as the IG for the next three months to allow for a robust and efficient process of appointing a new IG. Uh, I think this is not unconnected with the desire of Mr. President to not only have a smooth handover, but to also ensure that right uh, officer is being appointed. Yes, you're watching Newsweek on TVC News. Um, the, ten the IG has been extended by another three months. Um, how, Oyeka, I'll bring that to you. Yeah. What do you think about the reason presented for his, the extension of the IG's tenure? Um, personally, I don't see any sense in it. Um, legally also, um, there are arguments that the, the, how do you call him present IG, if he's no longer a police officer? Because he ceased to be a police officer first of February. So you can't put something on nothing, basically. Um, I've searched, I read through the police, um, new police act signed by this same president. There is nothing suggesting any of the powers that the Minister of Police Affairs is alluding to. Um, so I expect some people may be going to court come Monday to test the position of the federal government. Um, in fact, I, don't, I want to say I don't want to be discussing a matter that is likely to become subjudice. <laughs> 
So I think I leave it at that because be, operationally, there should be a succession plan. We are seeing an MO repeat itself, even with the service chief and the police chief. It's a narrative that is playing out. For me, as a young Nigerian, um, you can see how old the Minister of Police Affairs is. So definitely for me, these are people who are old, um, almost should be at their point of rest, taking well-deserved rest. Otherwise, I don't see any sense in saying we need additional three months okay, since, for since, succession planning. Right, since nobody has gone to court yet, yes. so we're not running uh, the risk of no, being subjudiced here. It's in court already. It's in court already. Yeah, the matter is in court it's already. In court so already. I, yeah, I sense Even before like this extension. Uh, so. Before this extension. Yes. Okay, thank you for bringing us, uh, bringing us uh, that notice. So we'll just let the matter rest. Thank if not, you. I wanted to explore it the more. So um, let's relate it now to the, um, it, um, kind of the names of the outgone service chiefs before the Senate. How do you situate that, Uzana, within the context of calls by this same Senate in the past waiting to, you know, either confirm or deny confirmation uh, that, you know, these servicemen should be let go because they were unable to rein in on the security problems of the country while their tenure lasted? You see, every passing moment you want to recover from one disappointment, you are hit by another. The, but um, a lot of people will no longer be disappointed by what government of the day, you know, their actions, because we've seen a government that is overwhelmingly patronizing. We've seen a government that applies analog solutions to digital problems. We've seen a government that um, is a bit detached from what is going on all over the world. If not, I do not see why men who had put in their best in serving the country would be, um, instead of allowing them to rest and perhaps find out what, the, what else to do with their life, we are putting them up for ambassadorial, ambassadorial positions, if not over patronizing. So um, I, I wish Nigerians the best of luck because we will keep dealing with this, um, what we found ourselves in where where it is difficult to properly assess what you know needs to be done and move on. Let, let me give you an example of what is going on right now. Emirates Airline stopped operations, you know, lifting passengers from Nigeria, you know, yesterday because of a misunderstanding over COVID-19 testing. They will only bring in passengers from Dubai into Nigeria, but not leaders from here. It started yesterday. And passengers, Nigerians, most of them Nigerians, are stranded at the airport. Part of those people are supposed to be at work tomorrow, Monday, in US and many other parts of the world. Why do we have that? Because we have a system that is detached from reality of the moment. So that, that's just my, my, my explanation for this. If not, I do not see why. The, the, like you asked uh, Onyekachi, you know, about the uh, IGP's um, resign, I mean, uh, Ex extension. extension of tenure. He, his, his date of birth was fixed the day he was born. So everybody knew when he would turn 60. His year of retirement was fixed the day he was enlisted in the police. So from the beginning, from the time he was appointed IG, the date he would retire was known. What happened to planning and getting ready for that succession before we get there, if not the same approach to issues? Remember, we spent six months without ministers at the beginning of this administration. Mm. Let's uh, relate the IGP's the extension of his tenure to other appointments that analysts are talking about, particularly as it has to do with this presidency. And Onyekachi, I'm glad you are Onyekachi Adekoya. <laughs> <laughs> so let's situate it with the, with, with, within the context of, yeah. of the principle of federal character. So how reflective of the appointments in recent times are of the principle of federal character? I think I'll leave that for the political analysts to, to delve into. I'm, I'm a security professional. I don't deal with um, conjectures and, and the rest. I guess there's a bit of a problem there, but that is, that's outside my own remit. But what I want to say is that um, on the issue of the headers farmers, just to bring us back and focus us again, 
uh, why Nigerian? I, I want to share a bit of a different perspective. The headers are the ones receiving the shortest end of the stick, as it is today. The northern elites make promises to them year in, year out, and they fulfill nothing. They come short of their promise every time there's an election cycle after that happens. Otherwise, the northern elite and the northern governor should come outside and say to Nigerians what they have done for the headers. The headers contribute about almost 30, 40 percent to the northern economy. There is nothing to show that the governors of the north have done for the headers. All but but some that's not an excuse say, no, for no, the that's not an excuse. continuing I'm just, clashes and the killings. I'm just trying to tell you why I say most of our is issues witnessing. are political. Okay. When you drum up unnecessary sentiments, suggesting you are supporting the people, when the real action on the ground shows that you are not doing anything to support them, then the insincerity lies very bare. Okay? The northern headers, they can't head in the northwest. The issue of armed banditry and cattle rustling, I talked about organized armed groups, criminal enterprises that have transnational links. They are running riot in the northwest. Boko Haram ISWAP is in the northeast. Medugri had the largest cattle population. They can't head cattle in the northeast. They can't head cattle in the northwest. They can't even settle in the north central. So they are having to fan out. And they are having to fan out along with armed militiamen because they are looking for self-sustenance. The root cause of the problem is that this set of people have been abandoned by their own. It doesn't now mean that in the south or in the north central, we should bear the brunt. But I'm just saying, hey, let us focus back again on the root cause of the problem. If this is the way of life and a major business, what is the north doing to support their own? Other than telling the southern governor who said, leave the forest reserve. Any sitting governor who is the chief executive officer of the state can ask you to leave. It's, that's why it's called a reserve. So it's an issue of law. Rather than address the issue of law, we are finding sentiments, ethno-religious sentiments, so that we can Let me bring it to Zona. Do you agree with his argument to, to large, about irresponsibility on the part to of a large extent, northern elites? Yes, because, okay, look at it this way. The North has the largest landmass in Nigeria. So if they want to create uh, reserves for the cattle, it's easy. It is left for them to find out the proper way of doing the business, because I keep referring to as business, of doing the business today. Create whatever they need for the, uh, um, um, the, 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 the cattle. The, it will now have a chain result of other businesses that will grow from it. But no, they wouldn't pay attention to that because everybody amongst them, they want cheap money that comes from the Niger Delta oil instead of paying attention to the real economy the, of their people. That business mm. on tap is over that's, five, five billion dollars in value that's another, that's another shade to the discussion. We can't go into it. If not, we're not going to leave this table today. We thank you very much for watching Newsweek this week. Same time next week, we'll bring you another edition of the program. I'd like to thank my guest, Zona Noya, Executive Editor, TVC News, and Oye Kachi Adikoya. I wonder if you uh, tried to escape that question because of the cap you're wearing. The conversation will continue after this break. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.